Welcome, everybody. Hey, uh, this is our kickoff uh, program meeting for the uh, the fall for the, the program season. Uh, we have folks in here. We have folks on Zoom. I am betting we'll have many uh, join us uh, as we move forward. Um, so I want to welcome folks. Uh, let's see. I, I, let's see. Is it going to behave? No, it's not going to behave. Okay, TC. Work your magic, buddy. Give me another one. Okay. Um, just to share a, a few quick announcements, um, we're going to be doing all our meetings hybrid again this year. Uh, in person will be here as it was last year. Uh, we'll be doing the Zoom link. We're not going to do the Facebook link. Um, it's one of the things that was adding too much to the challenge of making this happen. Uh, we'll hope that's not a, a, a burden. Um, if it is, we'll try to figure out a solution. But uh, right now, we're, in, we're planning to broadcast through Zoom. So you can tell your buddies if they're feeling sick, stay home, watch it on Zoom. Um, if if they don't want to drive from Rochester, uh, then watch it on Zoom, and we'll see how this works. Uh, we will be uh, um, making a recording. We're making a recording, and that'll get posted up on YouTube. So if you missed a meeting or you want to go back and review it for one of those cool things that Nick mentions but you just forgot to write down, recordings on YouTube. Okay, if you're on Zoom, just like uh, before, keep it on mute. Um, the views that you get to select from, uh, we suggest a speaker view side by side. Um, and uh, if you want to ask questions, we have a sound system. We can hear you, and I think you can hear questions in the room. We'll, we'll check in on making sure that works right. But... Uh, Go ahead and ask those questions. It really kind of makes it flow if you do ask. Okay. My thing, it doesn't work at all, does it? It worked, uh, it worked one time. It works one time. Okay. Is Bob on? He's not. He's Bob's not on. Well, um, I'm going to say thank you to Bob anyway. Um, Bob Carlson has been our program chair since 2016 and i served as a program chair i think i did it for two or three years bob has been a program chair um others others it's it's a lot of work to put together a meaningful program and bob carlson did it in my opinion better than anybody did um and uh bob is ready for not doing it any longer. He's 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 uh, done it now for uh, eight years and six years, and and so um, we'll be giving Bob an engraved box with the club and his name, and uh, I guess we'll maybe try to do that in November's meeting. Okay. Um, let's see. Go ahead. Click me again. Um, I want to just share with you that the November uh, program session is being arranged at the moment. Uh, the speaker is going to be Ralph Rothfelder. He should be on the line here a little bit later. He said he's going to join, but join late. Uh, if you've done the Cohocton River trip, uh, you have met Ralph. He's, he's loyal to that trip. Um, Ralph is the new conservation chair for Canandaigua Trout Unlimited. He takes over the legacy of Al Kraus, and uh, we've asked him to come in and talk about uh, the work that has gone on, on, uh, on sponsored by their club, and he's probably going to talk about some other stuff, like stuff that extends back to when our club was founded, uh, on conservation of the Cohocton River. And uh, you may be aware that our club helped to fund 
um, some of those projects. And so if you'd like to hear more about that, show up in November. Uh, we'll be back on our normal Monday time frame uh, uh, in November. Okay, give me a click. Um, just a reminder um, that we have two Facebook entities. We have a page and a group. The page is where we put out the official announcements and events. The group is where we share fish pictures and, and uh, exchange. Uh, and uh, so all those uh, are things if you're not hooked into, you want to. Okay, go ahead, click me again. And here's what they look like. Um, and those will be in the recording. So if you want to go back and hook into those, or if you're having trouble, give me an email. All right. Before we introduce the speaker, we have uh, kind of an occasion tonight. So tonight is Dick Naylor's birthday. Yes. <laughs> and I want to share with you that when Dick Naylor joined our club, it was his birthday. And I'm not remembering exactly how old you were, but you were in your 70s. Yeah. And he, he said to me, I can remember this. I'll always remember this. He said, I want to say something. I'm Dick Naylor. He said, this is my birthday. And he said, I had my family take me out to dinner early so I could come to this <laughs> event. Do you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> I will never forget that. So happy birthday, Dick. Yes. Thank yeah. You. All right. Uh oh. So these are little cupcakes. And there's a candle. Oh, cakes and snacks. Oh, we. So we get any better than that? We, the and you want to get a. Yeah. I can't believe that. I think you guys know the song. You ready to go? Yeah. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy, Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Wonderful guys. <laughs> okay. Hey. Thank you. Wow. That's, that was a, I'll start these around the back. Of the okay. okay. We'll get switcherooed here. Click it works, click it doesn't work sometimes. Uh, I don't think it works. Point it in the right direction. Why don't you do the intro while I, I'll run this? Oh, no, no. I, there's multiple. I, I, I too. completely. Uh, but, <laughs> all right. So we are. Um, so our speaker for tonight is uh, Nick Sagnabini. Uh, am I in frame? <laughs> Here we go. All right, there we go. So um, uh, a Buffalo native, Nick grew up around uh, the water from day one, fishing the open, fishing the opening day trout season with his father and friends was a tradition that still stands today. What was putting a worm on a hook has now turned into tying flies uh, to fool weary, weary trout and other species. Nick has been guiding uh, the 716 for years and takes a passion in the diversity of the fishery. As a year-round fly fishing guide, he provides you with expertise of all species to target 12 months a year. Whether guiding Lake Erie and Ontario steelhead runs throughout the winter, musky fishing the lakes and rivers of the Southern Tier, or drift boat trips for the great trout fishing and hatches of the Allegheny Mountains, Nick has spent thousands of hours on the water fine tuning the fisheries to make trips successful and enjoyable. Uh, Nick started his professional guiding career in the small ski town of Ellicottville, 45 minutes south of Buffalo in the Southern tier and uh, 
I mean, he's been great to get to, to know the past hour and a half, couple hours, <laughs> yes. and uh, he's been here before. So give him a warm welcome. It's great to have him back. Thanks, man. Thank you. All right. TC, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, let me pull a little Kirk action here and there we go. Uh, you got the easy one. I, I, you could have made it worse for me. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, thank you, TC. Again, my name is Nick Sagnabeni. I'm from Buffalo originally. I uh, now reside in the southern tier uh, town of Ellicottville. Uh, I've been a full-time guide down there for eight, nine years now, uh, but I've been fishing since I can remember. Um, I came a couple of years just before COVID and, and presented my uh, trophy trout, uh, targeting trophy trout on the fly. Um, if you were there for that one, I've updated a couple things and, um, I love targeting, uh, big trout, but I more or less love targeting and, and figuring out the large fish species of, of anything. Um, musky pike, smallmouth, river walleyes, river trout. Uh, I really will put a fly in front of any fish species and try to figure them all out. Uh, and the good thing about Western New York, and a lot of it pertains to this area as well, is uh, diversity. I mean, we've got more fish species than we can count on both hands. Um, four seasons of fishable uh, water. Um, and where I'm at in Western New York, I'm also a, a Pennsylvania registered guide. So I utilize a lot of the water in Northwestern Pennsylvania. Um, I do everything there except for uh, their steelhead streams because too many people. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, I look forward to uh, talking to you guys and, and filling in with a lot of tips, techniques, strategies I've used over the years, um, things that have worked. Um, and uh, if we have questions, I'll ask almost every slide or two. Otherwise, I'll have a question, a uh, little seminar at the end. Um, so just jot it down uh, and we'll go back over it. So I think, um, go ahead there, Kirk. I think I got a table of contents here that I'll go over for you. You're working through this. Yeah, so we'll go over first our area trout waters, uh, our uh, targeting per time of the year, um, basically covering all four seasons there, um, tips, techniques for each season, what, what I'm looking at, what I'm looking for, uh, approaches and approaches per scenario, size of the stream, um, water levels, water color, um, will detail where and why I'm going to a certain stretch or a certain stream. Um, my tools utilize what rods I'm using, what flies I'm using. Um, my favorite instances that I've had in places, uh, and then we'll go, uh, through questions. So, all right, Kirk, whenever you're ready there. Oh. Can't sleep on the switch. Can I? <laughs> all right. That doing what you want? Yeah, do one more. Right. Oh, yes. So we'll start off with um, targeting, you know, time of years right here. We've got a, uh, an early spring, uh, large fish on, and we'll get to some of my favorite water, a marginal stream. Um, this is Great Valley Creek in Western New York. Uh, it holds pike, bass, carp, and trout. And during certain times of the spring, it has great hatches, not a lot of hatches, but some hatches um, that I've learned over the years from spending time on it um, to really target down. That fish was just under 24 inches. Um, and so you can see it's just about dark. If you watch him feeding, he's not moving. We've got, we've got bugs just rolling right down his conveyor belt. Um, and that is uh, really, um, an indicator of a good large fish a lot of times um, for the dry fly scene of a fish sitting in his spot and letting everything come to him. Uh, big smart fish gets big for that reason. 
Um, little ener energy expenditure there, um, but just a quick uh, little video clip there. Um, and he was eating sulfur spinners. There was there was quite a few on the water that day. Most of my presentation today for targeting these trophy trout really kind of run into streamers, but during the different times of the years, and we'll go over the techniques of why I'm targeting large fish on some nymphs and not streamer fishing or dry flies and not nymphing per se. Um, about an hour before this, there were so many sulfurs in the air that you couldn't even breathe, but there were not anything eating them. Below the surface, there was probably a lot of feeding going on. But what I'm looking for in a moment like this on this stream on this time of year is for them to come to the surface because the ones that will eventually come to the surface and feed like this, I know will be a large trout. I could nymph through different runs and I could spend time picking apart different fish and I probably will get into some good fish, but that's where I put the brakes on and I wait and look for signs like this. So you can go ahead to the next one there. Some of these, um, if it kind of looks plain when you hit next, they are some videos. Yeah, hang on a second. My mouse is misbehaving. Is he supposed to? Yep, one more. Mm, one more now, too. <laughs> there we go. So we'll start off with uh, spring and early summer. Uh, right when the water temperatures begin to come out of their winter, winter temps, winter levels, winter flows, um, things really start to warm. I'm looking for low forties when I really start to try to, um, zone in on certain fisheries and looking for big trout. Um, the good thing about those springs, and these are the sulfur spinners. If you, you kind of make them out just everywhere on that creek that day they are just I mean, you couldn't you had patches like this just full of them and the trout will just come up and it was like fishing some western style rivers um for that hatch scenario there uh but this was a good streamer eater um mid-april as soon as our season opened thankfully now it's year-round uh catch and release which makes me happy because there's a lot of waters uh where big fish roam um that we couldn't get into at once so this fish came out of um a uh, a really healthy tributary in western new york um ate a small streamer nothing huge but it was just presented right during the right time um it was one of the few fish of the day and it turned out to be a dandy, um, but getting into those warmer early spring days, again, I like to look at 40 degrees is my starting point um, coming out of winter where I know those fish are really gonna start moving around. Um, kind of my favorite time to be trout fishing in general uh after our long winters um we've had some some good ones the last couple of years uh and the bugs are more active uh we got a lot of macro invertebrates that are moving around getting into um, 40 degrees and pushing up um and it just creates a lot of good opportunistic uh, moments for big fish to feed um in the right areas uh, you can go ahead and. Uh, so when you're talking 40 degrees, you're talking water temp. I'm talking water temp, and I will. I, I'll fish 32 and up. Yeah. But when that those creeks really start to average a 40 degree mark, I see a big, big difference in their metabolism, and they start feeding big time. And, and like mentally, about. What, what time is that? April? Early April normally. Yeah, we've had some late winters as of late. Um, I, last April 1st, I think yeah, I spent about 10 minutes on the creek because I couldn't move my hands. And so those moments were yeah, it's just you, you can go out and you can put the time in. But targeting, which is really what I like to do, is is uh, is to hunt the larger fish on their. Mo it's like a moon cycle for muskies or pike or something like that, or big bucks. You got to find the right opportunity to go after them and find them um, on the right days. It's very similar with finding large fish. Um, every day you can be out there and you will get lucky. I'm really all about fine tuning. Um, 
everything as a whole to have a higher percentage chance of catching a, a larger fish and larger normally you know i love anything over 15 inches i love any trout but a large fish uh categorizes for me technically around 20 inches and above all right Four. yep so with the springtime uh the flows are raised they stay level until in western new york our area um probably about early june um and i actually think we may have skipped a slide here kirk real quick okay yeah that's it right be if we go i uh it was right before the next one we skip yep one more no no, no. there we go oh mm. looks like they don't show up there do they all right, that's all i got okay so i would really quick want to touch on our um our waters in our area water uh systems you guys have the cohocton here uh in western new york i've got the upper cataraugus i've got the wiscoy system um i've got the upper allegheny system our entire area based on a geology factor is very similar when i first came out here a couple of years ago to talk about it i was excited because a lot of what i do pertains to this central new york area as well um very similar geology a lot of shell clay limestone um um, all at once was glacially impacted. So based on that, um, it really depends on my tributaries as well that I'm going to fish. One might be dirtier than the other. One might have more spring influence than the other. Um, tributaries like the upper Cataraugus, me and TC were talking about it earlier. Um, the Cataraugus is a phenomenal fishery. Our Lake Erie's biggest tributary. Uh, there's a dam 30 miles up that stops all the lake run uh, fish from entering. But above that dam, you have great wild trout population. Uh, and you have some 400 miles, 300 miles of tributaries um, and main stem Cataraugus to fish. Uh, but what you run into in a lot of places there is clay sediment. Uh, a heavy rainfall and impact will really create an issue for the Cataraugus and its tributaries for a while. Um, waiting for that to clear depends on how much water fell, the time of the year. Um, if it's middle of winter, that clearing is going to take a lot longer, um, normally because our water levels are up. So things stay a little colored a little bit longer in the summer, depending on the rainfall. If it's a big rainfall, it'll drop right out and clear. Um, but normally in the winter, uh, things stay up and high and off color a little bit longer. I'm a big fan of fishing in the winter and we'll have a slide on that next. Um, but uh, really, it's a four seasons game on targeting um, the trophy trout. This year, summer, spring, summer, and fall, this was early summer here. It was a small spring fed tributary um, of the Cataraugus. Uh, everything was blown out. We got into here, this fish ate a hopper pattern and the color, it was just a little bit off color. For this tributary to get off color, it takes a lot. Uh, it's really, really gotta, got a dump and for it to stay off color um an inch and a half to two inches has to has to come down in the summer um but what i'm looking at uh when something like that happens in the summer is this right here i am on uh the doppler radar more than a weatherman and the reason is because as we get into the uh, late spring, early summer, midsummer, things turn really uh, spotty, especially coming off Lake Erie here. We get some lake effect showers. The lake a lot of times stops rain or systems when they come over. It'll block the Buffalo, the Springville area, and the Dunkirk area from getting heavier rainfalls here. So as you can see, a perfect example is that that wind shear coming off the lake blocks this close stuff to Buffalo. Um, therefore, I know basically looking at this on a 5 p.m., me prepping for the next day, what to look for. 
I'm going to forget about all of these systems right here, basically all the way up through Al Albany or Albion and Rochester, but heavily looking into this Warsaw, south of Springville. This is Chautauqua County right here, Cattaraugus County and Allegheny County. Three high quality trout fisheries. Um, you have the upper Genesee River that flows right through here. You've got the upper Cattaraugus that's going to be coming right in here. And then you've got the whole upper Allegheny system right in here. So right there, by looking at that on a 5 p.m. on a Monday, I can already count on what I'm going to fish the next day. A couple, couple different options there. As we get into watching wave things progress through the evening, we might have an inch and a half of rain falling here. We might have a half inch or a quarter falling here. That's going to be a, a, a simple indicator for me, um, again, of just classifying where I'm going to fish and why. In the summer and the fall, this is what I want. I want as much rain as possible without absolutely blowing it out. If it absolutely blows these streams out, that's fine because in a day they'll drop these summer flows. They really cut off the water tables low. It's hot out. It's dry. Um, in the early summer trees are soaking up all that water, vegetation, bushes. Uh, so based off of that, um, really starts getting me tuned into what I'm going to fish and why, and what I'm looking for. Um, Besides having rain, you really run into some of the most difficult time of the year for trout fishing. You might have some summer hatches that come off on some of the really cold water streams. You get trichos that happen. Um, those tiny, tiny mayflies in the July there um, that do bring up some good fish. That's the last of the really targetable big fish dry fly stuff that I look for. Once trichos are done, I find it very difficult to continue to target those large fish. Um, they go down into the, the pools. There's normally, with the water low, there's normally a lot of fish in those pools. Getting through a lot of the smaller fish to the bigger fish seems like a little difficulty. So what I end up doing is I find a lot of the small tributaries. This is seven, eight feet wide, spring fed, has a little color, great undercut banks ice cold um, fish, big fish specifically will push into these tributaries and find good pockets and good holes. And when I talk to landowners, when I go ask permission to, to enter these tribs and they say, no, there's nothing back there. And, you know, I'll fish for a couple hours and I'll come back and, you know, I'll let them know. And I'll say, I'm holding you to the death that you don't tell anybody but I show them some pictures uh, and they can't believe it. And, you know, a lot of times I'll walk through small tributaries in the summer and kick my leg under, under uh, bushes and debris and undercuts and don't spook anything. Those fish will bury themselves in banks. Uh, Scott Cornett, our region biologist to region nine, the whole Western New York area here has told me multiple times during their summer shocking surveys of big, big brown stuffed into beaver holes or muskrat holes. And they'll sit in there catatonically till dark, basically not moving all daylight long. And in the summer, we've got 12 plus 14 hours of daylight. Um, and they're not moving. So targeting them, you really have to focus on rain events, cool weather events, cold fronts, something to change the scene for them to wanna come out and feed or move. Um, and this was, again, getting into the um, uh, summertime, small streams, hatches wound down. We're into terrestrials, um, ants, some beetles, some grasshoppers. Uh, you find good pockets and a little colored up water in the summer. The upper Cohocton is a great example, a hell of a fishery. It's got lots of fish in it. When that water levels drop and you're looking for the big fish, you're picking through those smaller fish um, to try to find them. But when you run yourself into a good rain event, um, and depending on the water color, the dirtier the, the water color, 
I like to streamer fish, um, a white streamer, a chartreuse, something that pops a little bit, more or less for me, uh, just so I can see it. In a tributary like this, I can see the fly halfway, three quarters down in a pool that's three, four feet deep. Um, that fish, he's gonna feel it. It's, it's a predator, 18, 20, 22, 24 inches, that lateral line, they're seven years old give or take, they know when to feed, they can feel that that presence of a bait fish, something on the water, um, and when they wanna eat, they will take advantage of it. Just like any large fish. Um, I fish a lot of blown out stuff, and in a sense, it's, it's kind of difficult to fish because you can't see a lot of stuff, but if you just think about what your fly is doing when you're casting it in, cast it to the bank, think about how fast it's sinking, bring it across, strip a little line and make the fly move a little bit, vibrations. That long lateral line is like the, just the fish's eyes, basically, it'll feel it. And around us, um, I think this was in the slide that um, went kaput, um, we ha don't have fantastic hatches. From us being in the ge geological zone that we are, uh, from all the glaciers receding and all the sediment coming down, you see a fine line in Western New York heading south, right almost at the New York border in the Allegheny National Mountains of our freestone streams having really a lot of clay influence on the banks, um, different bends, clay. You lose a lot of that. It turns into um, good freestone, bouldery, rocky, sandy um, creeks. But with our area being um, at once under the glaciers, we got a lot of that clay, a lot of that sediment. Um, and there are some great bug factories. I mean, the Quahocton has some great bugs in it. Um, the upper Wiscoy has some great bugs, but things like the upper Cataraugus, it has great fish, um, a pretty good population, but it's just kind of ugly. Um, there's a lot of clay and it doesn't take much for that to blow out. And every time that blows out, it's doing nothing but dropping sediment. Uh, and so you're really killing a lot of the macroinvertebrates, um, the bug life in there. It has a hard time um, living and, and reproducing and becoming successful because of just the sedimentation and such. And at one time, I think, you know, our area was great, had great bugs. I mean, um, I wasn't around from a lot of uh, my peers that have I've talked to, you know, Owaka Creek, Wistoy Creek, the Upper Cohocton. There was more bugs than you could even shake a stick at. Um, over the years, sedimentation, um, bad land management, uh, it's all really just kind of come into play and, and really has done a number on, I think, the bugs. And you see it spring after spring. People who have been fishing these rivers for 50 years plus, um, they will fish one day compared to their 30 days in a spring because it's just they're tired of sitting on the bank waiting for something to happen, a couple bugs coming up, but there's just nothing going on. Fish populations, they, they bounce back and forth depending on the couple of years. A good couple of winters, we get good rainbows because the water in the spring is great for the reproduction. Um, big time rain events in the fall, big blowouts, we get a couple bad years of brown trout because they're blowing out all the eggs that are happening in November, early December. Um, so you see those fluctuations happen. Um, but you can always count on, in our whole area, we've got great spring influence, fantastic spring influence. Um, you can always count on there being some larger trout involved on them. Back home, we got a slide about this too. And even here, we get into some marginal fisheries, whether it be from sedimentation or it's just, there's no trees surrounding it for a lot of it. It just stays warm. It's kind of ugly. Um, a lot of bait fish, maybe bass, maybe carp, maybe pike. But in those types of tributaries, all over here, you've got trout living. A lot of the area around here, you've got brook trout streams coming into the warm Cohocton. Well, guess what? Those brookies at one time are in the Cohocton. They're in there feeding in the winter because the temperatures are cold. Um, it's survivable. Um, 
but then they're moving out of there as soon as things warm up. So you get that fish movement, um, and that's like where this fish came out of. It probably came out of a 15, 20 foot tributary that this this creek feeds, um, and it took refuge and it was hanging out for for most of the spring. Um, and unfortunately, with that sedimentation issue that we run into, um, it really kills the bugs. And that's where finding the trophy trout turns into a majority time of the streamer game. Um, but getting into summer too, the feeding patterns change, my fly patterns change. I'm gonna use some uh, bigger bugs, bigger flies in the in the late spring, spring, late spring, early summer, because the fish are happier. They're not as conglomerated into pools. They're not into smaller tributaries taking refuge. They're not spooked. They haven't been fished over for, for uh, a couple weeks, months, so be it. Um, so my fly, my fly patterns will change, um, and again, the the biggest thing I can say about trying to find large trout in summertime or, or early fall when the levels are low and it's just not appeasing um, is rain events. Um, rain events and base it off of streams that you have fished historically that you know there are fish in um, and you don't get anything that one time you need to come back you need to a lot of my fine tuning has been going to these tributaries and just walking them sticking my leg in the undercut banks uh, my buddies hate on me every time because i'll fish a pool and then I'll walk right through it. And they're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I just want to see if there's something in here uh, that is, of course, not eating. So, you know, if it works out for you, take a walk through the pool, stick your waiting staff underneath the bank, stick it under a tree, just see if anything moves around. And if there is something, well, the next rain event, you know, you can go back and you at least have a pool that you can target a fish at. It's all about finding a target. Um, yes, they move around. I to this day have never hit a large fish in the same pool twice. They have shocked a couple that have been living in the same pool. Uh, I think there has been one fish in our Western New York region that has lived in the same pool for four years. Um, I've never caught them. I've never found them, but uh, I have yet to find a fish in the same pool. And that just means you've got to continue to work up and down tributaries, up and down streams. Don't hesitate to, you know, fish a new stretch or walk a new stretch and just take your notes to how does it look? What are the pools like? What is the sediment like? Is there a big clay bank? When it blows out or we get a half inch of rain, is that clay bank going to blow the rest of the creek? A um, lot of notes, a lot of mental notes, a lot of hand notes. Um, I utilize a lot of technology that we'll get into here as well. Um, that becomes huge for me. Um, it's easy. Uh, I, 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 I'm not good at writing. I mean, I can write, I can, write, I can read and write, but a lot of the stuff I do is technology based. I have a map set up. I pin points. I put notes on these points, that sort of thing. Um, you know, I see some of you guys with journals and notebooks, boom, put it right in the notebook, um, time, date, temperature, what you're looking at, and then come back to it. So that's some keys on my summer, summer and fall. But the main thing that I really want to stress is wait for those rain events and take a look at the Doppler. I watch the news. Um, our news stations, 247. Uh, I'm guessing you guys have the same news stations here, 247. I watch that live Doppler. I'm up waking up when I'm doing a trip the next day. I'm either staying up or, or waking up at the 10 o'clock or the 11 o'clock news at 1016 or 1116, because that's when the live weather is. And that's when you can get an updated kind of model of what the rain is gonna do. It's not always exact, but it gives me a good enough relative picture for their future outlook of where I wanna focus or what I think would be okay. So, um... Nick, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to paraphrase. There are a couple of questions that people were asking in the chat. Yeah. But but I'm going to summarize. I, I think what they're asking is, okay, you're looking at this kind of what's going on in the area. Yeah. And you've given us a really good appreciation for how the different watersheds will clear differently because of their geology and, and yep. so forth. And we've got to be mindful of that. And you've also told us the fish will move around. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, those are kind of 
you frame up the things that are moving. Uh, my question is, what do you, what what are you looking for? Are are you looking to go in the middle of the torrent? Are you looking to avoid it? Uh, are you looking for clearing water? What are you looking? So for? I think on a, a a slide here next it should good. it should get into it. I think I get into winter here, and then I get in what I'm approaching per um season. Okay. No no worries at all. What I'm approaching per season? Why a couple videos? How I approach them? Um. But great question. I mean, I don't want you to just go to a, a stream that you think is right and just start flicking flies around, which can be productive. Um, we'll go over uh, detailed where I'm casting that fly, what I'm doing with the fly. Am I letting it go down to the bottom? Am I keeping it at the surface? Am I let, casting straight across and swinging through? Am I stack mending line to allow it to drift to a tree and then I'm coming tight and then the fly comes tight and grabs the current and swings across? We, I've got some um, good kind of pointers on that um, coming up here. Cool. Winter. So this is my, um, just about my favorite time to fish. In winter, uh, we've got our best water levels. And normally with our, our, our water table that's up, uh, comes good color. Uh, we don't really need a, a good snow event or things like that. A lot of our um, bigger systems, 20, 30 feet wide, uh, stay great color all winter long things like the Cohocton. Um, a lot of spring influence there, but if you get down to some of this bigger water, again, which I like in the winter because from all the tributaries that are feeding it, you have fish that have pushed into them in the fall, potentially spawned, and they may hang out, but you're also going to get fish that push out of those tributaries into the main system. So um, with our highest water levels and some sort of off colorness, um, if there's a melt event or something like that, um, I'll, again, find some of my favorite systems, think about what the color might be like, what I'm going to target, um, and really kind of start there. Uh, but nymphing can be productive in high priority zones a riffle coming down to a nice slow pool right where that riffle enters that slow pool is where i'm going to target and i'm going to nymph i'm going to try five different nymphs maybe more um if i don't get a bite maybe change up even more because i know on again being at some of these tributaries i know there's fish in here i'm not getting them on nymphs maybe i need to change my nymphs Maybe I need to change my bobber depth. Am I Euro nymphing, tight line nymphing where I'm, I'm on bottom and I can just feel the end of the rod ticking? Um, most of my fishing in the winter though is streamer fishing. And the reason behind that is because you run into some opportunistic fish. And I've got a question mark behind that because are they opportunistic or am I putting the streamer in front of their face and they're going to eat it because it's a high caloric meal. It's right in front of them. They're sluggish. It's cold. I know after being in the water for 10 minutes, even with waiters, I, my legs don't really move when I get out. So uh, I can't imagine what it's be like being a fish in 32, 34, 35 degree water. So I'm in a sense prospecting high priority zones with a streamer, um, which is a soft spot over here. If you press it one more time, Kirk, I think this might this might play here. You'll see a little example. This is some of my favorite color here. Great green, a nice chalky green. You can see the stones here. We've got like two and a half, three feet of visibility and boom, right there. So, and we'll get in this next one, approaching how I'm going to fish and why. This is just like, I'm drooling over this. That's why I took a video. I walked up and I was like, oh man, this looks good. You've just got everything that you could want on a winter trout streamer session right here. Um, a little small, you know, you can, you can nymph. Um, this is probably seven, eight feet wide, some debris in there. Again, you can get some nymphs in there and work them slow and probably get a fish or two, but Again, what I'm looking for is not a fish or two. I'm looking for the fish. Um, 
I'm going to walk up to this pool and I'm going to start at the top and I'm going to get above it and I'm going to start swinging some flies right into this stuff, right into the soft edge. So I'm going to put it into the current. I want it to drop to mid column and I'm going to swing it to the edge. Boom, one swing. Then I'm going to drop it right here, two swing, drop it right here, three swing right here for swing and what i'm doing is i'm getting that fly and ideally i like to use semi heavy fly some with a bead head a tungsten head on a scenario like this um some flies i'll pass around here i got a box of my favorites and what i utilize them for um and i'll actually grab one here and show you on a on a on a scenario like this what i'd be using so here I've got a tungsten jigged head bugger, and I've got a big cone head bugger. So what I'm doing with these is I'm dropping it in the center of that current there, and I can pass those around there. You feel the weight on that, that, that jigged one especially. You feel the weight on that. What I want to do is I want to get it in their face. I want to get in their zone. I really want to um, not make the fish move too far for it because what I find in the winter is one swipe, two swipe maybe, and then you're done. I really find you get a two swipe max on brown trout. Um, Rainbows, they can be a little dumber. They, they might, they might hit, they might hit a couple more times than two. But when I miss a fish twice, I almost know that it is a brown trout because that's just what they do. They're territorial. They're angry. They're they're pissy. They're they're aggressive. Um, and so I'm dropping that fly and I might even start further out. I might start right on this bank. It looks a little undercut. So I'm dropping that in there. I've got a seven, eight foot leader, and it's tapered probably down to two X in this color. I'd go two X. Um, so that's 10 pound ish, I believe, um, enough to snag and hopefully pull it out. But, um, two, three X is what I look for normally on my tippet, but I'm dropping it on that edge, that heavy fly boom, drops right in. I may give it because I can work this whole stretch here with minimal energy. I may just cast it in there and let it sink this much, but then I'm tightening up. I'm tightening my line and I want it to swing to the bank, not super quick. So I'm above this. I'm standing right here. I want to be basically casting downstream and swinging it across, taking a step downstream, swinging it across another step downstream. So, so we're working this in a grid pattern um, and flies dropping in foot, two foot down, swinging to the bank, one or two or three casts doing that stepping and I'm moving. Um, I'm not sitting here working this pool for 30 minutes, 20 minutes. Um, you know, it's, it's not a run and gun scenario, but I wait till I feel comfortable that I've cast it in. I know I have moved that fly through the money zone. Uh, if there was a fish sitting down there, especially in the winter, he's not at the top of the surface. They're just not, they're in a slow edge, um, on a seam in an undercut zone, um, behind a piece of debris. Uh, and if there's nothing happening, you know, I'm pushing through. So we run this whole, uh, this whole run down here. And if you click it one more time, you'll see how it, it slows out. Well, it starts slow. And so it just dies right out in the, in the back there, which is great. All under, that was probably four and a half, five foot deep. I'm doing the same thing from the top of that run to the bottom of that run. And I may take a little slower time, a little more time towards the back, but look at all this soft stuff. That's just like, oof, I love it. I love it. So when you sort of drop that fly in, getting to the strike zone is important. And that's why I'm utilizing those flies because in the winter, we have our highest flows. We've normally got the most water. If you use a, uh, a fly with a lot of material, then you got to throw some split shots on it, or you've got to throw a sink tip on, or you got to do a full sink line. And you still got a piece of leader that isn't going to sink right away. 
anyway. So it doesn't matter what fly you have on, unless it's something dense and heavy or and small, relatively speaking. Like if the water was bigger, double, triple the size, I would be okay utilizing uh, a sink tip or a, a, a bigger fly that was still heavy because it gives me a chance to get it down still into the meat and potatoes of the pool. For this one, it's small. So that fly has got to drop right in and get to my strike zone as soon as possible. And so I'm casting it in there. I'm keeping my rod tip up. I've got that angle and I'm just trying to jig my fly, keep it moving across the whole thing into the slower back end of it, maybe even slower, just softly. And with the jig head, you know, it is kind of jigging it around, but I'm getting to the strike zone and there's nothing more important than doing that. It doesn't matter what time of year, um, except for maybe late spring, early summer, when they'll swim five feet, I've had them come out and smash a fly, not in the winter. It's very rare unless you get that crazy bite window that happens once a winter um, where they're chasing you down. You really want to put that in their zone. So I think uh, one more video here. Uh, what? That one on the right might be a, yeah, it is. Yep. Oh, you like that. Cool. So again, another win midwinter streamer eater. Um, beautiful Christ missed me the first time and i i saw his size i took a step back step up and all i did was make sure that i'm getting that fly right into a strike zone again um no faster slower i want that fly to present if it was spring or summer and I, I would think about stripping the fly quicker or moving it quicker through his zone again in the winter Take it slow. You know, I'm really, I'd rather be closer to the bottom than the top. So um, we get to the next one there. Okay, so we're on a little bigger water now. This is the upper Cataraugus, um, maybe February. Um, and in this video, you'll see a couple um, different uh, styles of water in here. And this is where we're going to talk about approaches per my technique. So you've got a little dead zone in there, a couple feet deep. This is shallow in front of me. But as we go down the pool, the depth come towards the bank and the whole pool turns nice. So... This is a very important um, scenario for me. And if you pause it right here, Kirk, if possible. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> nice work. Did I do it? You did it. So again, this is like six, six inches to a foot deep right in front of me. Over here, we've got a great pocket some structure in there, um, right on the edge of some moving water, some slower water. Uh, go ahead and play it again. I'll have you stop it in a second again though. Okay. As it comes down the pool, it opens up. Go ahead and stop it right here. Oh, it. that's okay. So having a pool like this, basically a pizza slice coming out towards you, you have to, go ahead and pause it right here. You have to think about how you're going to work that pool, because if I just go up and I work the head of that pool right there uh, that we first showed this, I'm going to step through this water and this is all going to turn to chocolate milk and I'm going to kick sediment up. So ideally, I always like to start at the top of the pool, but this is a perfect example where I'm not going to start at the top of the pool. I'm going to start in the middle here and I want to fish this tail out first and slowly work my way up to this deeper stuff. As I get to the very top, I'm backing out and I'm coming up above that, that pocket and then I'm gonna approach it upstream wise there. If you go into this pool and it's very, I've had more times than less, me kicking sediment downstream just doesn't bode well. It just, it just doesn't. I have had those crazy scenarios where I've walked back and forth through a creek, fished the pool right below where I walked it and caught a good fish, but it just is not the norm. Um, uh, my buddies love going in, stirring their feet, kicking up bugs, doing that. I'm like, no, 
done not working for me. I really want to get in on the water without having any effects or anything known that uh, I'm there. So I'm working that whole back edge first. I'm going to come right in on the top back corner there. Okay, I got to come back. Yeah. So there's many of times when you're fishing a pool and there's an eddy mm -hmm. and you and you walk in the sediment in the eddy and it just brings this humongous cloud of and it just reciprocates there and yeah. kind of comes out. Yeah. And it'll kill the whole pool. Do you, do you believe that puts the fish down? I think so. I, yeah. On a lot of the tributaries that I'm fishing, they're big wild fish. They're right. they're not some stocker stock fish they'll eat it, you know it's not a big deal but why do you want to potentially do that when it could alter your catch rate but it's really easy to do you have to be really cautious when you're fishing pools e e exactly and getting into like some of those small tributaries where you got the little addy in there not even a small tributary but where you kind of gotta you step your foot in and the bank slides out a little bit and it creates a little much it's not awful but then i'm just trying to get as many casts into that high percentage high percentage zone or where that sediment's gonna go i think it's gonna go before it hits before it hits even if it hits a little bit it's okay it's not the end of the world but I just, even in the winter, look, it's off color, but it's a brown. It's, this is a green color. It's a brown color that you're kicking up and you're getting, you're distorting that color. I, I don't know the logistics of it, um, the scientific uh, scenario of it, but um, they can sense the, whatever uh, the slightest change in water quality. They can sense it. Um, and it's, it's, uh, I can't think of what it is right now, but, um, any little alteration, especially on those spring, spring fed tributaries, um, they'll, they know something's different there. Absolutely. So it'll shut right down. So it'll shut right in a sense, shut right down. Yep. Um, just movement that I always try to be, um, you know, even rowing through some of those things. I don't want to hit an oar and create a little mud line into a good spot of the pool or anything. I just, it never hurts to just try to get in there and fish something without creating a disturbance of any, any sort. Um, so I will go right in the back end there and I'll fish that bottom third, probably a little more. I'll come out a little bit and I'll walk up. And as I, me coming out a little bit too helps downstream still, because I can fish, you know, if I come out here and come back in, I can really, that's my money zone but I can still hit that because I'm not like walking up this edge here. I'm backing out, coming in, backing out, coming in, backing out, coming in. Um, ideally, uh, these are some of the tougher uh, pools and styles to fish. Um, I really like um, kind of the upstream approach. If I can come in, uh, excuse me, downstream approach. If I can come in, I love fishing down. But the, the balance between blowing the water out below you as you continue to cross it and this and that um, and catching fish is something I'm always on my mind. Um, and it's just so much easier to work a pool and grid pattern it if you can come downstream on it normally because you're utilizing that current. You're not coming upstream on it. If you were nymphing, I'd always like to walk upstream because you're coming from the bottom and you're, you're casting upstream and you're nymphing when you're streamer fishing, which again comes into play for a lot of our area on targeting those large fish. Um, most of the time you want to, you want to have a downstream approach, start at the top of the pool and work your way down. So um, the side approach, high stick technique, doesn't really work here. It'll work a little bit at the end. Um, I brought in a nine, five, um, fly rod, nine foot five weight. I really like utilizing a little smaller rod, um, a three weight or a four weight an eight foot. Some of those small waters I'm fishing a seven, six, 
and we'll get into reasons behind that. Um, but for this water, a, a nine five is is perfect. This is 30, 40 feet wide, um, and it allows you to have a little backbone to cast across. I mean, there's a lot of water moving down, relatively speaking. Um, it's going to push your fly line, push your flies. Um, but again, if I'm fishing a sink tip or a sink line, and I'm coming up from downstream and trying to cast in to this pool, my fly line's coming across, my sink tip's coming across, more drag, more resistance. It's gonna pull my fly out of the zone I want it in. If I'm coming at a downstream angle, I can cut that current and my fly is just gonna be swimming upstream and I can swing it across. Grid patterning it is very difficult from your sideways unless you have a really active fish and they'll move for it. For cold water, you want to start up, casting to the bank, letting it sit, let it drop down a little bit, tighten that line and let it, let it swing. Little jerk strip in the middle of there, do what feels right. Again, getting to their zone though, you've got to really try to understand and think about where that fly is dropping in, how fast it's sinking. Um, even on those flies I pass around to you, I'll throw, a, I have a, um, a, a perfection loop on them and I throw a split shot on. I love a tiny split shot on those flies. It gets them down even more but I have control of it because I'm thinking about what it does. Even though that fly is heavy as hell and it's dropping in there, as soon as my line comes tight, I've got control of it. And that's where understanding the fundamentals of your line to your, uh, your rod, your line leader to fly. Um, you've got to feel it from top to bottom and understand what zone you're going to be in. And is it moving too fast? Is it moving too slow? Am I catching on bottom? You're always changing. I mean, there's de different depths throughout the whole thing. So you're always, you're always adjusting in a sense, putting a split shot on, taking a split shot off, putting two on. Um, it, it really depends on, on the pool. This back here is probably four feet, give or take, but that current is now pushing there. So again, with that current speed, if I come in on a side approach, even a little bit more upstream, I'm not gonna get where I want. I'm gonna be fishing, at, by the time my fly's in my strike zone that I want, it's gonna be down here. And that could be close to where my, my, my upper foot standing in here started to blow out. You start to work that limit. So the approach is key especially um, in the winter on a pool like this. Again, this was just a pool that is a great example of you really want to start, um, look at that pool, factor in, uh, is it deep? Is it wide and deep the whole way? Is it deep on the far bank? And then it deepens out right to your feet as you go down. Um, you're, you just have to factor in where you're going to be standing, how quick your fly is going to get down to the strike zone um, and adjust through there. And again, and the flies are key. I fish a lot of flies, but for times like this, I've got five flies I fish. So go ahead and you can run right through this one here. This shows uh, me telling the dog to hold on there so I could fish a pool. And this is um, Elton Creek uh, that feeds the Cataraugus. I've got a big log jam here, but back here, all soft, all beautiful, soft, four feet uh, deep water. So I worked all of this. See this heavy current here? I worked back there. And now what I'm doing is I'm working into the pool. I'm taking a step, reach casting, taking a step, reach casting. I'm throwing the fly behind me, lobbing it forward into there. Rod tip up right over that tree. I'm just working the fly right back in. Pop, pop it off the tree, right back in there again, slow, methodically. Um, I know there's a fish sitting in there. This was uh, early spring. So the water, water temps were a little, um, a little cold still. Would they be sitting in this stuff? Absolutely. Look at this soft stuff on the edge, prime feeding habitat. So really just go up to these pools and this is you can't even start this pool from from walking upstream you have to go to the top of it and work your way down it um but it was a, a good western new york rainbow i think i've even got some debris on there somehow landed it 
but uh, just the approach. I mean, I just, if there's one thing that people ask me, you know, for targeting, targeting the trout, what the biggest is going to be, it's really approach. And that's getting into some of our bigger rainbows that we've got. Um, that was, I don't know, 13-ish. I, I think they shot, they really top out about 15. We get some giant 16s, but you never see them. Um, but yeah, just an example there of boom, structure, fish the main structure jam, and then I'm just working my way into the slow stuff. You're gonna lose flies. You're gonna get caught up. I mean, there's nothing you can do about it, but like I tell my clients, if you're not in the debris, you're not catching fish. If you're not pushing the limits, if you're not in the tree branch that's above the perfect pocket, I'm glad you tried because it's just, it's going to happen. It's, it's fly fishing. I mean, that's why Kirk ties a billion flies so he can lose them all. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, you know, just there, there's a, a, a lot of key elements, um, but grid patterning that were is really, it was really key. Oops. Did I miss them? Mm, oh, here we go again. So um, now we're going reverse way. You know, uh, now we're start we're starting upstream here. We've got a basically a three foot deep run that goes straight down. We've got some undercut quick current, but some undercut brush right down the edge here. And see how quick it's moving? And a boom boulder right there, structure. So this soft stuff is a little nicer. That's nice. This is nice. The middle, unless there's some rocks down there for that fish to sit on. My key elements here, my key um, uh, places I'm looking are right in front of that tree there, right in the front pillow of that rock and right behind um, soft edges, especially in the winter, the soft stuff is your friend. Um, let the current do the work for you. This pool, boom, look at it. I start here and I'm just gonna slowly work my way, grid patterning it completely out. A couple feet by a couple feet in the winter when I get a lot of my bigger fish, working it out again, like we talked about getting the fly in front of their face. They're not gonna chase it too far. You're not gonna have one coming from this bank all the way across here. It's just, they're not gonna do it. Um, you may get a small one and yeah, you know, I, I love catching fish, but the older I get, the more mature of an angler I get, I really am doing everything in my possibility to single out those bigger fish or the adult fish in the pool. Um, and basically utilizing the current, saving energy, um, you know, a lot of times when I'm in the boat, um, whether I'm trout fishing, um, uh, the Allegheny or uh, musky fishing, just technique and utilizing everything you can to make it easier for you as an angler is so key. I mean, you may fish for a couple hours and at the end of your fishing session, you may be a little exhausted, but don't overwork yourself. Utilize your, your rod, uh, your line, the fly, um, currents. You know, if you're coming up this way and you're trying to, in a sense, streamer fish it, Every time you cast up, everything's coming right down at you. So you want to start at the top. If you're nymph fishing it, great pool to kind of come up from the bottom. You got soft edges. You know, you can cast up, drop the bobber right here. It's uh, drifting, drifting. Your flies are probably on bottom by here, coming right down the edge. I mean, that's just classic trout, trout edge right there. Um, so, you know, getting the flies down again, uh, the streamers tend to grab the attention. If you put a properly placed streamer in front of a large fish, um, they really, uh, I think, have a better chance of, of, of taking advantage of getting that uh, high caloric meal, little energy, but a good meal. I mean, it's just like me. I don't want to go that's at McDonald's. Happy meal, perfect. I'll crush it, little energy. Can I get it out the window? And I'm good to go. The fish do not want to move. Um, drop the fly into the head of the current. In this pool, three feet deep, give or take. 
I'm thinking about what that fly is going to do. I'm casting in. It's pushing down because the current is. But do I have a split shot on it? Is it going to sink a little bit more? As soon as I think I'm getting close to that strike zone, I'm taut on my line. And I'm swinging it. My arms reached out so it, it's not swinging across. It's kind of sitting in that current. Um, the longer your fly is in the strike zone, the higher percentage of getting a strike. Um, the longer your flies in a strike zone on a high percentage area or, and those higher percentage areas can be, um, you know, a higher percentage for a lot of trout hanging out or a higher percentage for a good trout hanging out. You've got a great uh, tree coming in um, like on that fire bank there right here in this soft stuff. I could see multiple trout hanging out. But on that far bank where there's just a, a good juicy pocket and a tree coming in, that's a prime lie for, for a good fish to be hanging out. Right there, that pocket right there. Boom, he sticks his nose into the right into the current, grabs a, grabs a bug, comes right out. Grabs a fish, comes right out. You know, you get some of this stuff. You could have big fish mixed in, but you're going to potentially pick through smaller fish or, or just not the fish. Um, so am I fishing this first? It depends where I'm standing. If I'm right here, I'm going to drop that fly on the bank. I'm going to throw a stack mend. So I'm going to throw some line into the current and keep my rod tip up. What that's going to do is that's going to give my fly a second. Say it, that fly hits right here and I throw a stack mend. That fly does not leave that soft edge until I come tight and bring it off that edge. So I'm dropping it in there. I'm giving it a second to get down and then my arms up and my rod, my lines tight and that fly boom initiates its swing. And guess where it's swinging right in that money zone. And it should be a foot or two deep. Therefore I'm putting it in a high percentage area in a feeding lane in a prime lie. And then, I'm going to swing that baby right across into my B plus water like that. I would classify as a, we get into some C and this is just winter time style. Um, the fast stuff, I, you know, you, you're going to pick a fish off here and there. They're going to be sitting in it. The rainbows, especially um, back home in Western New York, like to sit in the little quicker stuff, but a rainbow is not getting to 24 inches. So I'm not going to pass up a rainbow, but I want to be in that money zone in the A in the A zone before I get to uh, the B zone here. So you got A on the far bank, you've got B in the, or C in the middle because it's quick. The water's cold. You don't have a lot of fish that are really in that stuff feeding. And then you get into the B zone, which um, a slow soft edge where a lot of fish are probably um, hanging out. Um, and you have that opportunity to, to hit a good fish out of there. And I would never say pass up fishing this first. If someone asked me, would you ever, if I told you to make a cast there, would you make a cast first? Yeah, because I just, whatever fish is there, I just catch and get out of the way. Then I could maybe even get in further. But starting where I was starting on this run, a far bank, letting it sink, come right across the bottom, a little strip as it hits the soft stuff because it's gonna slow down. So you'll need to pull a little slack in. Boom. That's kind of, that's how I would approach, um, this scenario and the stack mend. I stack, stack my line a lot and it's not just sitting there throwing line out. Sometimes it is. If I'm, if I'm dropping a fly in some fast stuff and I can't get onto a slow pool without feeding it deep in there, I can drop that fly in and my line could be tight and I can get it in there but my fly is going to be at the top of the water column with stacking it. My fly will start to sink. And then as soon as I'm thinking about what my fly is doing into my strike zone, I'm tight. And as soon as you're tight and you're, you're feeling it swing and it's in the soft zone. I mean, that is where those, those opportunities for, for getting a good fish are going to come about. Hey, Nick, uh, for some of the folks, uh, they're newer to fly fishing. Help them understand what a stack mend is. So a stack mend um, is where you make a cast 
and then you're immediately getting slack out of the end of your rod tip. And what that's doing is allowing your fly to sink naturally. It's you're allowing it to um, do whatever it would be doing without you attached to it. Um, and in a case like this, I cast across. I'm throwing slack out the end of the rod tip. And it takes a little bit to really get used to being able to pull a little line out and get it through all your eyelets to have slack out. Um, I may throw some slack out and then mend all that slack. And in this case, it would be very doable where I would cast to that bank, I would let slack out the end of the rod, maybe three feet, mend it, and then my line is actually in a straight line and my fly is in the strike zone. So in that case, as soon as it goes tight, my fly is swinging and it's already a foot and a half, two feet, three feet under. Um, whereas if I casted tight across and I didn't let slack out of the end of the rod um, and allow that fly to sink, as soon as it goes across, it starts moving. That's not what I want in the summertime, maybe, or, or, or spring, maybe, but they're not moving for the fly like that. So I'm just getting a couple feet of line out of the end of the rod. I'm mending it over the current, and that's allowing my fly to get to my strike zone, to my, my high percentage area, um, and then bring it across. So you can stack mend with anything. A lot of times when you're nymph fishing, you can stack mend. Um, you're casting your bobber out. You're waiting for your flies to drop and they're coming into you. You throw some line out, you get it ready because as soon as the bobber passes you and starts going downstream, you've already got line out and it's pulling the line out instead of uh, you having to pull line off of your reel or off of your rod already. So not a lot. I'm not, I'm not casting out there and going like this. A lot of times I've already got the line sitting below me three feet, maybe give or take. And when you really start to understand the functionality of a rod and the line, um, especially one that you own and you fish a lot, you realize what it takes to just roll the rod tip and the line pulls itself out. You get a certain part of the head on some of these fly lines that are weighted more that allow it to um, mend or roll off a lot easier. So a lot of the steel headlines are um, heavy front taper because they allow you to mend um, with minimal energy. You stick the rod tip up in the air. You've got a lot of your weight focused on the end of that fly line, a little rod tip flick, and your whole line goes over because you've got a lot of the weight in the front. Um, doesn't always necessarily have to be the, the key having a, um, a, a weight forward, um, heavy, dense line. Um, but, you know, I'm fishing a lot of times with just a, a standard floating line. Um, I'm just understanding how my rod and reel and my line works from fishing it enough. Again, it's just about getting out on the water enough. Just go walk a stream, understand it make some casts, just feel how it, it functions. So in a sense, that's, that's a uh, stack mending and feeding. Where am I fishing and why? Okay. So my Bible are the USGS gauges as much as possible. I'm utilizing it. Unfortunately, um, with a lot of our waters, you've got gauges on the Cahocton here. Um, the Genesee has some gauges. The, the Cataraugus does not have a gauge on its upper end. It has a gauge on its lower end. So that takes some, some thought on dialing in when that's fishable because um, it shows a turbidity scale on our, on our gauge on the Cataraugus. Fishable turbidity is about 20 FNU, which means that anything over 20 FNU at that gauge is blown out. It's just unfishable. So I, over the years, you have to think about what 20 FNU or ideally down there on the gauge, because we're, the gauge is about 10 miles down, um, give or take, of our trout waters. So I want that FNU on that gauge to be at 100 turbidity, where it's absolutely blown out down there. Because 
again, water levels make it different a little bit. If it's higher, it might be a little more blown out up top. If it's lower, it might not be blown out up top. But 100 turbidity on our gauge on the Cataraugus allows me to, to realize that I have a good fishable opportunity on the upper end. Normally, it's a little off color. The water's up a little bit. Um, but you really, it takes a while to figure those things out. Again, we're touching back on get out there, go fish, the, go fish a stretch. And if it feeds into some place with a gauge, what's that gauge say that day? What's it looking like? Um, if that gauge is at a, a hundred FNU and it's at a thousand um, cubic feet a second, which is a lot of water for the Cataraugus, it's probably absolutely perfect up top. That's, that is what my mind's thinking from being on it multiple times. Um, and the tributaries to it are probably looking fantastic. But again, then you run into what, what time of year is it? Is it spotty showers? Um, was it raining, raining in Springville on the upper end of the Cataraugus? Was it raining right on... Uh, right on the gauge. Um, you're always fine tuning details and things like that, but the US GS gauges for our area, we have a select few that I rely on big time. And we thankfully have them in enough areas, a north, a, a west, uh, an east, and a south of me, to where based on the rain event that we just had, I can look at a gauge in the relative area of where I'd like to fish and get a glimpse, um, uh, get an idea of what things are looking like, relatively speaking. So the New York State DEC website, shocking reports. Um, I've read them all a hundred times. Um, biologist reports. Um, I'm really, really lucky to be involved um, with the biologists over at the DEC. We do a lot of work together, thankfully. Um, they give me a lot of what I call cheat codes, um, where they shock some good fish or where they're, they're doing this or stream bank restoration. Or, it's always different, but they're year after year, they keep doing these sh uh, shocking surveys. So you can get a glimpse of what a population is doing. You again, will have those fluctuations based on the prior year or the prior two years, heavy rainfall in the spring or the fall is going to alter those, those reproductive um, scenarios for rainbows or Browns or brookies. Um, so you are going to see the fluctuations in numbers. Um, you're gonna see more adult fish one year. You're gonna see less adult fish. You're gonna see um, less fish overall, but a higher biomass, which means you've got nothing but giants rolling around, but you've got them once every mile. Um, so biologist reports are, are really good. Obviously the local weather reports we've touched on as well as the time of year um, and where those fish are moving. Um, but time of year, the gauges, um, the Doppler, um, are probably my two most um, keyed in elements. Where do I find USGS? So you, I, I go to Google um, and you can type in uh, USGS gauges, actually. You can type that right in. They've got them for every state. You pick your state, you can pick a map view and they'll show you, like for this area, they'll show you on the Cahocton where the gauges are. You can click them. You can look at five years ago. You can look at, some of them are even older. They've been keeping records for a long time um, on, on some of them. Um, others are relatively new. I would have a gauge on a lot more creeks, but they apparently are very expensive. Um, but you can go right to Google, US Geological Survey gauges, pick the state, pick your zone. It's really very, it's as simple as it sounds of going in and um, looking, you know, whether it's up in Dansville by the Cahocton up there, I don't know if they've got gauges. You can see a gauge up there and then follow it down um, all the way to Chamong. Um, was it the Tioga is not far? Right. So there's gauges on all of those. Would it help? You understand how to do that or i could post a link to the usgs site on our facebook page uh do you want are you on the facebook group yeah okay cool I'll, okay i'll do that there's there's really good information on that i'll also mention that a number of the crowd unlimited chapters are beginning to put gauges on the streams 
uh, in addition to USGS, which gives us a new piece of information. Yeah. Uh, and we'll hear more about that next month. Um, and those are accessible in a different way. And um, I believe the next slide here I have. Uh... And this was a, a springtime fish, small tributary, loaded with brookies. Undoubtedly, this guy has a couple of brook trout in his belly. There's no doubt about it. And again, I was pool hopping, just went over, bright watercolor, um, walked down it a little bit, couple casts, and just really quality um, fish. and the dog. Resource mapper and Google Maps. Again, even bigger Bible, Google Maps. If you, if I were to open my Google Maps right now, I probably got 3,000 pins. There's just blue pins everywhere. I've got everything marked. Um, I've got a little note on it. And a lot of times there's notes that only I can read by just saying slob pool or, or good corner or, or great bend or something like that. Because as soon as I, re as soon as I, I note that, um, I remember what it looks like. It's just something to correlate um, my brain with what I, I'm floating a river, great pool I come up on, boom, I, if I can get on, I got, I'm marking it. Um, and it just, it helps me just remember, um, but also rain events. I look at where my pins are based on the rain events and I'll go towards those and see what I'm thinking is right. Um, but this is the New York, this is the DEC resource mapper. They recently changed this up. If you look here, I've got, well, let's see, does it say the name of the, the river here? It doesn't, but it shows you the water body classifications. Um, a standard CT with a C classification. So what this means, CT, cold water and trout, boom. Thank you, DEC. They just told me at one time they have shocked trout or found trout in this tributary. The classification of C unfortunately means that a, a farmer can drive his tractor through it. When you start getting into the classifications of CT, um, then they come with more like the Cohocton on the upper stretches undoubtedly is gonna be a, a, a higher classified tributary, a higher classified stream where you can't alter any, you can't cut a tree out without talking to the DEC or something of the sorts. So this, and we're going on 10 years ago, I would stare at this thing for hours. Thank God I wasn't married. I didn't have a girlfriend. So it was very easy for me to hop on and look at it for hours. And if you zoom in on it, you just see how many tributaries and trickles you can actually click on and they'll tell you. Now with it being CT, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's trout in there. They're just at one time was trout. But what that means to me, as a big fish hunter is that it has the qualities that can potentially hold fish. A CT means that it's not a high, high quality fishery that may have some trout, may have some warm water species in there, but that means that the trout that are in it are gonna be giants. They're gonna be good fish. They're gonna be what we call a marginal trout fishery again. Probably getting into the temperatures where it doesn't really correlate with having good uh, populations, but it's got a high biomass of not a lot of fish. So the fish that you find are normally good fish. Um, there's other tributary, there's other, st the standard would be CTS, high quality, trout spawning. So those ones I know I would for sure find trout in to this day. Um, again, they updated this map. It's much easier. It's a much more sophisticated one. Um, excuse me. It correlates with um, the new regulations that they put in where you can fish uh, October 15th through April 1st now, catch and release, artificials only everywhere, um, whereas before you couldn't. And a lot of these CT are not public fisheries. They're on private land. They're not really 
uh, places that people go and fish, maybe for the first couple of weeks of the opener because they stock them. But after that, not really, they see no foot traffic. Um, and because they was, there was no PFR on and no public fishing rights, they were technically closed um, in the winter, which is very unfortunate because um, the winter fishing on these tributaries can just provide some giant, giant browns. Like the Cahocton, I'm guessing at a point that you weren't able to fish some of it. Or was that one that the whole system was open year round? The, the Cahocton was open year round. It was open year round. Like the Jenny. Jenny, okay. And the Chemung? Uh, the Chemung is or, far minor. Or, um, excuse me. Um, they, there's uh, one more. What is it? So uh, for us, our three trout rivers are Genesee, Cohoct, and Kiyuta. Yeah, that's it. Yep. And they're all the same class. They are. Okay. Uh, the, the advantage now is that our friends could kill fish all winter, mm -hmm. but they no longer can do that. Yep. It's out catch and release. Yep, exactly. So, you know, back home, uh, and I know there's definitely uh, tributaries here. Um that are are similar where you know there's not a lot of pfr in this in the trout season they were open um and then come winter they closed come october they closed but now you can get onto those fisheries um and a lot of my fishing in the winter for trout are on these types of fisheries where there's not public fishing rights you know it's landowner permission only um and a lot of the good water is right there too. Um, never look down on some of that um, marginal stuff. And that's something we'll get into as well, but. Just uh, for everybody's information that the DEC just recently updated uh, the, that resource thing. And yep. I had posted that up on Facebook uh, early summer. So uh, if that's news to you, go back and look in the Facebook feed. Uh, there's, there's good information. To get the public fishing rights, you have to actually dig into the maps itself. Hopefully those will be added. Yeah, and they, um, they on the map, the new mapper, I believe, they put a lot of, um, they classified them, um, like high quality, basically yeah, yeah. medium and then low quality. Um, and they have a lot of those three, um, marked those three, uh, basically levels of fisheries marked, but what they don't have marked is the, the marginal stuff. That stuff that doesn't have PFR on it. Um, even some of our small, um, but brook trout streams back home um, don't have PFR on them. So historically they were closed in the winter. Um, now they're open for catch and release, um, but they're high quality. And because there's no PFR, they're not on the mapper. And they may be on the mapper, but they're not classified. So, you know, that was one, one of my things coming into the new developments of the regulations and the new mapper was, oh man, here go all my honey holes because a lot of the streams I fish aren't, there's no PFR, they're not classified. So I was afraid that they were gonna be put on as like trout streams, even though they would be low quality, but they don't have it like that still, thankfully. So, um, but there's a lot of information on there, it gives you details on a lot of good, good waters, uh, good water sheds, um, and then correlate them with a biology report. See a shocking report from last year or two years ago. Um, you know, just get into some details um, of what you're fishing or what you're looking to fish. Um, and starting at that new resource mapper, Google Maps and biology reports, winter time is perfect for, for dialing that stuff in. Um, it can give you a, 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 an upper hand getting into the spring um, for sure. And you can walk them in the winter. I mean, depending where they are and what they are, you can take a, take a stroll and see what they look like um, and bring a rod. Uh, so, but... Big time resource mapper, Google Maps uh, help out. Uh, and so this is June 27th and I'll show you kind of uh, the flow differentials between the summer, um, uh, summer and winter. So 
heavy rainfall events. We started out at three tenths of an inch, boom, up to eight tenths. Um, even so, that's still in the summertime, that's a good blast. That's a good straight up kind of up there scenario. Um, drops down over a day and it's almost right back to where it was before. Um, this is perfect for summertime. This is what I look for on the summertime session. Um, normally on these blowouts, as much as I love finding fish, more of my fish come from this next day and a half. Um, just because, I don't know, I try to ask them, but they don't answer me. I, they don't eat, they don't eat that day. I don't know why you, I do find them occasionally, you know, that water coming up, it gets them going. But um, on those summertime blowouts, unless it's a long gated rainfall event, it's boom, right up. Uh, a lot of debris in the water, a lot of junk. Um, but this day and a half, two days here after, um, phenomenal. This is my hopper stuff in June um, or small streamers. This is what I'm looking for. This is touch off color water. Water levels are up a little bit. Uh, the fish are a little happy still before it gets right back down to the bottom. Um, and the main thing is you normally get a temperature cool off. 58 degrees. By the end of the day, that, uh, that day was like 65, 66. And I notice as soon as it hits 63, 64 on a lot of my small wild tributaries, um, those fish, they just kind of start to just, they're, they're, they don't start to eat. You know, I hit that temperature threshold and they, you notice the difference. It's like night and day. Um, I don't even have to stick my thermometer in the water anymore. When they start slowing down, I already know it's like, all right, it's getting to the point where they gave me their all and now they're getting back to their um, regular flows, regular level scenarios. So um, that's just a quick insert. I block that out because that's one of my gold mine uh, creeks that I can't let anybody know, of course. Um, and it's got a gauge, go figure. Um, but uh, I think the next one here, we've got um, our January flow. So we start out at one, boom, snow melt right up to four. So that is a serious rise and it does drop pretty good, but the levels are still much higher a day later, two days later, still higher. And you just a slow, gradual um, downturn. Whereas the summer, you've got a pretty darn good spike. The day or two after um, are your money times, your money zone times. Um, whereas this, I'm looking at two, three days days after. Um, and the reason for that too is because in the winter time, if it rains and there's snow on the ground, even if it does rain, it's normally an ice cold rain. So you're just kind of, you're adding just as much cold water to it as possible uh, as before, um, or you're melting snow. So you're just pushing in ice cold water. Giving it a day or two, normally it warms a touch, which isn't even the big difference. It's just the clarity in the levels. Um, at two feet, I mean, in cold water on this tributary, the uh, to get the fly into the strike zone, it's not. It's it's very difficult. Um, heavy, heavy flies. Even then, it's just wintertime blowouts like this, off color. Just it, it's uh, it's normally a multiple day later scenario, which, you know, you can kind of see it um, right here starts to get to where I like, which is two days later from the blowout. Two, yeah. What do we got here? The end of December 31st. So it was a New Year's blowout. Um, right here is what I'm looking for. And again, the water levels are great. This is the same tributary. We were down here in our summer flow. Look at us up here now in our winter levels. It's beautiful. This is right where I like it, right in the money zone here. So getting into the spring, it normally levels out about one and getting into July and August, you're down three, four, maybe. So those levels are huge and the fish you, you've you notice the difference um again getting into that summertime low water stuff unless there's a rain event i'm not necessarily wasting my time but i'm not wasting my time so gear list seven to ten foot rods you know i went over i've got a um a nine foot five weight here with a five weight floating line on it um i really like the smaller rods this one's a uh three weight a, a seven foot six three weight um 
especially on those small streams when I get that fly into that pocket and I get a 22, 23 incher. I mean, this thing, I remember this fish specifically, it came into the, it came out of the pool into the moving water right next to me, six inches deep, 10 inches deep, and like went straight up next to me. I could have grabbed it out of the air. I was like, what, what is going on? But it's fun, it's tight. So you need a shorter rod, you need a smaller rod. Um, the smaller the water, the shorter the rod, I really think. But it also allows you to get leverage on some streams streamers um you can get in and you can still with that shorter rod you get a little backbone in there um having that length unless i'm nymphing the shorter stuff seven six is really my favorite it's not too short it allows me a little length to, to manage some stuff um and handle the fish great so uh, i think i actually brought that rod last time that's an echo uh, E3. Uh, and I got like a, a two, three weight reel on it with a three weight floating line, nothing special. Um, because everything, this was June, I believe everything's fairly close combat on this stream. So, you know, a seven and a half foot leader down to, I might've had some three X on that day. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's what you're fishing, what you're, what you're going to target, um, your gear, is just as important as figuring out what where you're fishing. Um, my leader type, you know, I'm rarely using um, sink tips unless I'm on some very I'm on some bigger water. If I was floating the lower end of the Cahocton, um, I maybe would utilize a sink tip because it's 50 feet wide, someplace at 40 feet wide. So. Um, you really want to get down. You can drop it in there and that sink tip will get you deep, um, full sinking lines. Um, but for the most part, uh, split shot on the, or two on the fly. You know, I really like that because it gets that fly down immediately. You've got no drag, you've got no currents pushing it around. Um, and you start to really understand that, that your hand to that fly um, and the weight of that fly, you feel it. You start to understand what it's doing under there. The more you fish that way, the more you start to understand um, how that fly is, is acting and functioning every time you cast. Where that rod tip up, where you, how much line you have out. Um, again, getting to the strike zone is, is the first and foremost key. So split shots, you know, I had a couple split shots on that fly. But just a good, healthy, wild, um, small stream fish. He came straight up out of that stuff. The, his pool's down low, but he swam into that and came straight. I've never seen anything free willy like that in my life. It was it was wild. Tippet rings, they're okay. Um, Tippet rings, swivel, fly clips. I do the perfection loop, but... Um, Tipper rings are great too. They allow you to um, just have that natural swivel on it. No spinning, no twisting. Um, I utilize them sometimes, but mainly I'm straight leader. I'm straight fly line leader uh, to a perfection loop on the fly. So the fly clip. Fly clip. I actually don't use ever. I've seen them a little bit. I'm not a fan. I mean, it's supposed to make it easy to take a fly on and off, but. I just not for me. It just messes with my my brain thought and thinking of thinking more. It's just more than I want to do. I, I keep it simple with the perfection loop. Um, and then again, on certain cases, I'll throw a tippet ring on some of my some of my tippets. But favorite streamers again, very time of year dependent uh, based off how deep I need to get, what speed, what's uh, what season I'm fishing. Um, in the winter time, I like bigger streamers. This is called a Rouse's Poodle. It's got dumbbell eyes, a little material. I think I've got one in there. I could pass this box around. You can see some of my favorite streamers. I got a couple of my favorite nymphs. Um, but uh, even though we've got some snow here, this was like a early May hailstorm. Um, and the water was just a little lower than I wanted, but it was a good color. So I downsized my fly. I used that jigged um, uh, crystal bugger and got the fly right where it needed to be. Um, this was, I was fishing a little bigger water. So therefore I could have used a bigger fly, which I did. That fly kicks and jerks and moves great. Um, I think I've got a split shot right there too on the top of it. Um, 
again, you can use both, but if I really want my fly into the strike zone, it's just, that is the biggest difference of what I'm going to use. This is going to get you into the strike zone, no matter what, um, little, uh, little material, um, a split shot on it. I've actually got that fly tied right on, right onto that. And maybe I'll cut this off and pass this around too, because let's see here. There goes my teeth. Um, a trailer hook on them. Uh, I, again, it's more material. It's, if you can get that whole fly down, then throw it on. Um, lead tungsten weighted, you know, a lot of times I'll do a lot of red lead wraps on my flies. Therefore, I don't have to sometimes, I, I almost always fish a split shot on my perfection loop on my fly. I clamp it right on there. I don't do it on the piece of tippet. Um, I do it right on the loop. And that is as close to the fly as I can get. Therefore, that fly is going to get down. Uh, not the leader getting down and bringing the fly down because then I have a little movement. I like to be from, from what I'm thinking from my head through my arm all the way to my fly. I want to have complete control of that fly. If I put a split shot a couple inches up, um, there's a little playback there. Re relatively, you know, it's not a big deal, but how I like it and how I really think I function best is with a split shot on the perfection loop if I need to get that fly down. And the real, you know, casting a lot of times, find that balance between rod, reel, fly, uh, the line leader, everything fish with it um whether you know you're out there just casting around just just fish maybe a way you would if the water was high or off color or something like that just feel it um instead of not fishing like that ever going to the creek and fishing the heaviest fly that you haven't casted in four or five years and tangling up or, or just not being comfortable with it. Be, get comfortable with what you're fishing um and be confident in why if it's not working, you know, change up. If it's not working, go back to your high confidence fly. I love white. I love cream, um, especially in our streams. We got clay, so they get a little chalky. That white pops. That Rouse's poodle, some of that chartreuse um, flash in there is just it's beautiful in the water. It pops. They feel it. That, that trailer swings around nicely. Um, these are by far my two favorite flies, um, for trout fishing. Undoubtedly, this is my favorite articulated the Rouse's poodle and the crystal bugger, um, to get down in my strike zones, especially on the small stuff, uh, where I, it's gotta be down in that zone immediately because it, it can't go down four feet because then it's the end of the pool. So Colors, materials, like I said, I like white, um, but just fish something that you feel confident in. Black, purple, olive, a natural olive works fantastic. I would say white for our streams is pretty natural. We've got a lot of little bait fish, a lot of shiners, um, some chubs. Guess what they look like? That right there. So um, I fish those white more than any other color. Next would probably be black or olive. Um, but, you know, I, again, my, I just fishing confidently. Um, it's it's not a, always about the color. Some days it is. Some days you throw that different color on and you're like, oh, man, should have been fishing this thing all day. Other days it's just getting the fly where it needs to be. So. Um, so on that last slide there, I must have some font issues. Um, it says, I think this is some of my favorite stuff to fish is the marginal fishery stuff, which again, summertime, 70 degrees bass swimming around. I'm carping my trout streams that I'm fishing in the spring. Um, I'm looking at pike and you know, I tell people where I'm fishing and catching some trout and they're like, Oh yeah, I just caught a, a small mouth there the other day. And I'm like, yeah, well there's, there's trout around and getting into the summer. I won't target them. You know, there's, um, 
just unless it's the absolute right time of time of summer, right conditions. Um, normally my marginal trout fishery stuff, um, gets put on the back burner and in the summer the reason it gets put on the back burner too is because a lot of those big fish push into those colder tributaries where they can sit um, or they're sitting on a spring somewhere in those marginal fisheries um, but you know this was one of my marginal guys he's got one eye that's a, that eye is non-functional and he ate on that side so he felt it it was dirty um the next uh photos are some of my other marginal trout fishery fish and they're just, you know, they're just, they're, they're good fish. I, when you start dialing in those warmer water, those where you don't have great numbers of fish, um, like that lower end of the Cahocton here, it's just, it's got every piece of marginal trout fishery I look for. You've got a phenomenal upper end of the fishery, uh, a trout factory. You've got great creeks coming in, spring influences. Even though you get down, um, near Canona and whatnot, and it opens up and it just in summertime, there's smallmouth there. There are undoubtedly large fish in there. The water's deep enough. You've got enough cold water springs to keep them at least alive. Um, if they sit there in the winter, it's full of food, bait fish and uh, crayfish and uh, crustaceans. You know, when I'm nymphing, a lot of times I'm nymphing a, cra a crustacean pattern. I mean, I'm still fishing something with some some calories to it um unless it's on a couple certain tributary a couple certain rivers where the bug life is is good i'm fishing um some nymphs in there like um some beadhead pheasant tails um some princes some um euro nymphs some fine thin bodied um Paragon nymphs, just something that drops down again and gets you on the bottom. But for the most part, you know, a lot of these, these fish in our area, our geological region, um, will take advantage of, of a good meal, a, a nice quality meal. Um, and I mean, a couple, couple pictures here. These are these all, they're all eat streamers. So there's more. There, yeah. Just click them, man. And then, so there's there's why um, low density, big fish, less angling pressure, but lower catch rates, um, higher caloric meals, sculpins, dace, chubs, minnows, um, crayfish, other other trout, um, and just dialing those sections of river in and fishing them thoroughly, you get rewarded. So. Great. Thank you guys. Got some questions. Uh, if anybody, anybody has any, whether it's virtual or here. Um, okay, let me get the, oh, yeah, a couple questions. Yeah. So on the perfection loop, I just want to make sure I understand you're using a perfection loop to tie your streamer on and then you're attaching the shot. The exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, well, I just took it off, but yes, if you look on some of those flies, um, on the yellow one specifically in there, I've got a perfection loop, uh, uh, tied on still. Yeah. And I think a split shot right onto it. Um, and you know, that's, that makes it the split shots that far from the front of the fly. I just like all of my weight to be in one, not, I don't like to differentiate it a little bit. Again, sometimes there's some things where I do want that weight uh, up a little bit and it might give my fly a little jerking motion, which might be good having that little weight imbalance there. Um, most of the time though, um, I love it right on that. Right. Cool. Not I, have, I have another question yeah. about um, like swinging through the strike strike zone. Mm -hmm. So I get stack mending and like throwing an upstream mend in to get tight, but how do you like control the depth and keep your streamer from like swinging, like getting pushed back up in the current while you're swinging across? The weight, the weight of the fly. I mean, if my fly, like when I'm 
a lot of those examples, I'm fishing one of those weighted flies. It's all about breaking through that top of the water column, break through that water surface. Um, the water on the top of the column is moving quicker than the water on the bottom. So if you can break through that first, that top layer and get in there, it's not necessarily moving as fast as the top of the water column. So that's why on some of those examples, I'm casting across and I'm giving some slack because I want, if I don't give it slack, that fly is going to get caught in the top of the water column and swing right out. Giving it slack and throwing a, a mend in it or a, just kind of a stack, stack slack mend in it um, allows it to sink. My line's still floating down with it. And then I can pick that rod tip up tighten my line to the fly and my flies in the strike zone. And now I'm just, again, getting into the men mentality phase of it. You're thinking about where that fly is swinging across, um, ideally in the strike zone below that, that top water column. So any, with the drought this summer, how do you think the trout in your area held up? Uh, I bet you, just fine. I mean, we had a pretty serious drought, what, three years ago, something like that, um, where I saw very similar flows. Um, and it takes a, take, probably takes a toll. Uh, I bet you on a lot of the smaller fish too, um, being preyed on by other animals, herons, loons, or uh, herons, uh, uh, comorants, or mergansers, anything like that. Um, so I'm sure, you know, it, it doesn't benefit. That's, that's for sure. But a big fish, you know, he runs a pool or runs a spring. You could have a couple big fish sitting on a spring. Um, we've had, awful on and off years for as long as I've been fishing. And again, you know, you might run into just young of the year kills or it's easier for um, farm runoff to maybe kill. Um, I've got one of my favorite tributaries, unfortunately goes right through uh, a farmer's property. Um, and last time I was there, they were just standing in the middle of the creek, crapping. And it was literally, it turned the whole creek green. It was awful. <laughs> and I was like, how could anything survive this? They do. Um, you know, the water was low. The water was not warm, but it was on the upper end of uh, what I would fish it, about 62, 63, 64-ish. Um, and, and just, I get right to the pool and all the cows are standing up to me and they're all literally just standing in the water pooping and it's just making its way down to me and uh you just you have to wonder what it does but you know would those big fish that i'm catching out of there those two footers and bigger be in there if that those cows weren't doing that i don't know because if the cows weren't allowed if, it, if this stream was classified as a higher classification where the cows aren't allowed to run through the creek or really hang out in the creek. Would the trout population go up? Therefore, you'd have a higher density, but a lower biomass. So, you know, it sucks to watch that happen. Um, but it is also the tributary where I catch my biggest fish. Um, and there's another one that parallels it that is very similar. A lot of farm field, um, but just it's <laughs> good, great fish. Um, and on the upper ends of them, they're cold, they're clean, they're coming out of the ground, they're spring fed. Um, they just certain, they just hit a certain point of degradation of like, you know, they just start getting on that edge of really having a population versus just having a couple good fish in there. Um, so, you know, again, based on the drought, I think things will be okay. Um, getting in uh, the cooler weather here will start kind of as soon as those water levels get up um probably start you know investigating some stuff and and seeing what's going on um but i think they'll i think they'll be okay i mean they've been all right for previous droughts and i don't think this was the way this was a good one but um i think we've had some worse in the last five ten years so I don't, think here, I don't think here we had this was what was it was it bad here, here really it was really bad here. really yeah it was. so we i mean we it was bad it was bad but at one time the Cahawkton 
was at a level that it hadn't been since 1939. Really? I agree with what you were telling me about that. Wow. Yeah, was, so you may see a little a little deficit in that scene. Um, you know, again, I think a lot of the good, the bigger fish probably are okay. Um, but you probably lost a lot of fish due to stress, undoubtedly. Sitting in the mouths of, of colder tributaries coming in, whether they're getting eaten by other trout sitting there too. Um, you know, you see it on like Pine Creek that runs through central Pennsylvania. Um, you know, they stock like 50 bajillion trout in there. And every summer there's pictures of them sitting at all the, all the cold water influences just potted up. Um, you can't help to think the same things happen in there, but um, again, these fish are, I think they have a higher level of, um, they really can handle, they can handle some, some stuff. We've been beating on them for years on end um, on all fronts. So numbers probably down, maybe. Um, reproduction may be down from that this, this fall. You may notice it in a couple of years, in a year or two. Um, but I guess we'll have to find out here. <laughs> That's, we had a little bit of rain. It was pretty ugly for us, um, but it was it was about parallel with uh, like three or four years ago, I would say, in Western New York, Northwestern PA, where um, uh, it was it was we did okay that that year. Um, saw a young of the year decline a couple of years later. Um, or I, I guess a juvenile in adult decline from that year. Um, but it'll be interesting. You guys, you, do your biologists do some surveys and whatnot every, so they should be, they should be able to at least have an idea on some of the stuff. Yeah. Um, but the good thing about the upper Cohocton is, you know, there's a, there's a lot of river um, and a lot of springs coming in. So hopefully, um, that that helps sometimes too. Low waters help push those push the flows underground and back up, and it comes out colder. It it really does. Um, we've had that happen on a couple tributaries by us where the waters um, get colder coming out of um, of the ground because it's not flowing over the top of everything, warming up. It goes underground for X amount of stream uh, miles or yardage or whatever, and then pops back out, but it's ice cold. So yes, the water's lower, but that water's colder coming out downstream. So. Yeah, there's some streams. Um, Gosh, I'm trying to think of where the California, there was a study that just came out this past um, year where uh, they were getting reports on this, this fishery of absolutely gargantuan browns getting caught at night, yet they would shock it during the day and they would find no trout. And the trout, um, and if you Google this, you, you could probably find the article, um, the trout were burying themselves in the in the gravel and staying alive that way and coming out in um at dark when the water temperatures were cooler uh so that was something i've never read before that was pretty interesting and it goes to show you that they they have a, a little higher um they, they can handle a little more than than we think i believe so cool any questions online Any questions in the room? Well, I think I thank you guys very much for having me. Um, uh, if I met you last time here, you know, good to see you again. I'm glad to see a lot of faces that that turned out. It's it was good. Um, and you know, I've got some window decals, glass decals for you guys if you'd like. Um, I got some business cards. Anybody makes their way to Western New York, feel free to give me a call. Um, like I told TC here, you know, if you're making your way and you want to see what's fishing, I'll fill you in. I'll be happy to let you know. You ever want to do any steelhead fishing or Allegheny River floats or trout floats? Um, some of the spring trout floats I do are are like fishing the Delaware. Great hatches, great nymphing. Um, we run about 14 miles of river, uh, and it's for for. Middle of April to early June, 
like fishing in Montana. It's phenomenal. So um, we've got some great stuff out there, but I'm, I'd be happy to uh, point anyone in the right direction if they make their way to Western New York and do some fishing. Um, but look forward to maybe being back here sooner, soon as well. So. So thanks, Nick. If you uh, came a little later, uh, please feel free to hang around and socialize. That was part of the home. And for those of you joining online, uh, thanks. And we'll wish you a good evening. Uh, make sure you take your bar glasses back to the bar. And uh, thanks for the.